All right, so tech transfer taking flight. We've uh, just concluded a three-year project with, uh, well, within three months, we'll conclude a three-year project with in situ to transfer um, Scan Eagle over to liquid hydrogen flight and create an infrastructure for sustaining Scan Eagle on liquid hydrogen. And so the talk, though, is to kind of give you an idea for setting up the project for success, working with our industry partners. Um, Jeff Knapp, the chief uh, engineer of advanced systems at uh, in situ, just an incredible person to work with. Uh, Matthew Grubb and Wayne Goodrich, who are part of the team that worked with us extensively that um, at in situ. And then to walk through the tech transfer and some of the unforeseen problems that we couldn't have anticipated, but actually the synergy between Jaikati and actually having some of the resources at the university helped us to quickly get through some things that we're convinced neither industry or, or university alone would have been able to make it through. So that's kind of the story in a nutshell. We'll go through it just to do some quick review. So. Um, on the previous slide, I had Genie, a drone we built in 2012. It was supposed to be the first liquid hydrogen field drone developed by a university. And that was to get the attention of the aerospace industry in Washington State, because um, I was just a, a new professor then. And one day I called up uh, in situ and said, hey, we're outside your front door. Um, we've, I've got a team of students here. We were in the area. We want a tour. And, and they said, well, that's not really how this works. But if you come back next week, uh, you can watch a flight. And so we came back the next week, um, um, gave, told them about what we were doing. And they said, well, funny you should mention this. We've actually been wanting to make a liquid hydrogen version or a hydrogen powered version of Scan Eagle for a while. You've got a lot of these things figured out in ways that we hadn't gotten nearly as far with. Let's use Jay Cotty funds and get this uh, actually moving. And so we um, took the concept, which was to work, make the world's first 3D printed uh, cryogenic fuel tank. Um, as you can see over there, it's got uh, a bunch of vapor cooled shielded. Um, oh, hang on. Well, on the, on the left, it's got a bunch of vapor cooled shielded um, passages. And so the, the whole premise is that the hydrogen fuel, as it boils, the liquid boils, the vapors enter the cooling passages. And on their way towards the outside to flow out of the tank, they shield the liquid hydrogen from getting that heat transfer into it, and you've got a hydrogen fuel that's already warmed, ready to be consumed by the fuel cell with not a need for an external heat exchanger. Nobody had ever actually made a cryogenic tank like this, and so we got a patent right away um, with you know, 3D printing the tank liner concept and immediately went into integrating it into Scan Eagle. Um, this had a whole bunch of fundamental challenges associated with it. Um, for one thing, uh, there's virtually no data on 3D printed materials performing um, at cryogenic temperatures. You know, fatigue data, just tensile strength data, okay? So there was big uncertainties there as far as what materials we could use. There was also uncertainties with, with regards to permeation at cryogenic temperatures, and there's more IP coming out about that and, and expect some proposals here um, next year. Related, that's some really cool stuff. Um, you'll see, okay? <laughs> It involves quantum mechanics, it's fun. Um, it, it, we, we wouldn't have figured it out until, unless we had to work through this project. And so, um, yeah, and then reducing the manufacturing cost to end up getting a, a, something viable for a vehicle. So um, this is uh, Pat, Patrick Adam there in the middle. He was the PhD student that was charged with the project. We had to, we had to be somewhat careful working with in situ because this was obviously an ITAR restricted project. And so international trafficking and arms restrictions, you know, anything that could be used in a defense related project, you don't want to have the responsibility of having those drawings or images or products in your workplace where they could suddenly get into somebody who was trying to spy for another country or anything. And so we drew a line where in situ to had Matthew basically working as the integrator who would take our CAD models of just our product that we would send to them and then they managed all of the safety of their stuff on, on their end. We never actually had any of this actual stuff that was part of Scan Eagle. So that kind of drew a nice line in the sand where we didn't have to worry about some of that responsibility um, to an extent. But since we were actually building a prototype that eventually would get integrated in the vehicle, we were going to reach that line at some point where we had to worry about it. Um, we conducted extensive 3D printing of materials, got a bunch of papers published. Um, it's funny, folks from NASA and uh, companies in Europe are like, 
we've just had two or three people come talk to us about this, and you're like three years ahead of us, you know, as a result of this, doing a lot of this um, measurements. And so eventually we found a third-party uh, supplier working with in-situ who produced the tank, and there's Patrick in the middle. And when you get a smile like that, that's when you know graduate students worked for many, many years, and they've just accomplished something that shows the premise of their thesis is valid. Okay, um, that tank's actually filled with liquid nitrogen, and you can see a little bit of frost on the end of the tank um, because it's literally leaving almost at room temperature, and he's measuring the boil-off rate on a scale like that. Um, that was the prototype tank. We showed everything works, the concept works, validated his models, sent it off to another third-party manufacturer to be wrapped with carbon fiber for structural to be put back into the vehicle for testing. And when we got it back from that third-party manufacturer, um, we started seeing some real troubling things. Um, you know, number one, we were getting gas flow through the tank in ways that it shouldn't have been flowing through the tank, not, you know, the way we'd sent it out. And um, it came down to the point where we realized that something had been internally damaged in the tank. And we were scratching our heads within situ trying to figure out what's going on and how we're going to figure out what actually happened inside this vessel because you can't really put an endoscope or something in there and look around after it's been wrapped with carbon fiber and still preserve the tank. And so we were trying to figure out how can we use university resources to get through this. And Patrick thought about it and said, hey, our vet school has a CAT scan. You know, I'm, I'm just going to call them and see if they can do it. And he called them. They said, hey, bring it by in an hour and 45 minutes. You know, we've got an opening. And so Patrick shows up and sits in the waiting room. There was a beagle right next to him and a little girl with her cat in line. And, and he comes in and sits down with this cardboard box. And the, and the little girl sees this cardboard box, and she's thinking he's got a dead animal in there. And she's, she says, well, what's in the box? And he said, because the tank hadn't cured properly, it really stunk. And he said, it smells bad, and I didn't want to leave it out. And so then the girl was just terrified. But anyways, he takes the tank, in, and, and they get the CAT scan of it because we were worried it was a polymer. We didn't know if an x-ray or anything would work. And... When we got the CAT scans back, um, we could see that the third party manufacturer had imploded the tank because they did a test on it that wasn't permitted. They actually slammed it with 300 PSI of air when that's just one of the things that they just do and when they wrap these tanks like this. And it imploded the tank actually in two places, on the inner liner and the outer wall of the tank. And so we're like, gosh, okay, we just, we just invested a bunch of money in this prototype. I mean, what are we going to be able to prove with this? Well, you can actually learn a lot from a broken test um, prototype like this. Um, we took it down to in situ, and Jeff, he just set up his whole liquefier. I can't show the whole, you know, all the images of it, but he made full liquefaction system. He had liquid hydrogen there. He's like, well, look, Boeing in Spain says, your tank is not physically possible. They say your tank is going to have to sit for an entire day, you know, before it's actually ready for flight while we're trying to fill this thing with liquid hydrogen. And I'm like, huh. And it turns out they'd talked with one of the lead cryogenic firms in Europe, and they said, yep, it's going to take a full day. And I said, well, we've got these, you know, simple back-of-the-envelope calculations done. In fact, Patrick's thesis is all full of transient CFD model. It all says we can fill this thing in like eight minutes, you know. Uh, they said, well, no, not possible. And so Jeff said, well, let's just try to fill this thing with liquid hydrogen anyways. Who cares if it's got holes in the side of it? We're going to give it a shot. And we wanted to test our liquefier anyways. So we did. Um, compromised tank and all. There's Matthew holding it. He, as soon as we filled it with liquid hydrogen, blue liquid hydrogen all over the parking lot, the, he ran over and grabs it. He's wearing safety glasses, everybody. Uh, <laughs> And he picks it up and shakes it because he was worried about slosh uh, in the vessel and that the slosh might end up being a tough, a tough thing for a scan eagle to accomplish. But with that light of amount of, of hydrogen in the tank, he couldn't even feel it sloshing around in there. And it, it was just kind of a neat moment for him to just make the connection of how stable of a fuel it would be in a vehicle like this. And so we basically shown, validated our calculations. Everybody suddenly got quiet in Europe, and they were like, yep, these guys know what they're doing. We'll keep going with it. And so we basically got the whole system together. This time, this third round, you saw Kevin's poster over there um, developing the ground support equipment and developing a vapor-cooled shroud to make sure that we don't have any air condensation on the end of the tank. But in situ, also finally got the full version of Scan Eagle put together with the fuel cell and the electric motor and everything on it. And so... Um, that's what I'm going to show you here, just a quick little video of that. 
for a large drone being right on the back, back of it there, that's a lot of not, not a lot of noise at all. Not, in fact, maybe even less than a conventional quad rotor. And so that was one of the big things. We converted a conventional vehicle designed to fly on gasoline over to a quiet fuel like liquid hydrogen that they can produce on board of an aircraft carrier and drop the noise down that much while maintaining the flight envelope that they already had from their existing vehicle. So um, a couple little testimonies about this. Jeff, when I asked him, what do you want me to say when I go to talk to Jay Cotty, and this is the first thing he said, um, we at Institute could not have gotten close to understanding cryogenic hydrogen realm without Washington State. The skill set and knowledge base, let alone to address the safety besides the technology, would not have been possible. The reality is hydrogen is the safest fuel out there. I didn't ask him to say that. That's what he said. And when I got that, that said, hey, Jay Cotty is a big success, right? Not only are we taking stuff that industry wouldn't have been able to do or the university, we're actually finding a match there where we're adding value to each other because of this program. And Patrick, the PhD student, oh great, that got cut off, I'm sorry. Um, Basically, he was able to start his dream of a startup company with this, and, and the Jay Cotty funds more or less enabled that. He's going out for SBIR, STTR funds right now with his company, and he's figuring out how some of the third-party manufacturers that are trying to produce some of these systems, where they're failing. So in the end, you know, our connection in situ and WSUs is fantastic, and so one of the words of warning for some of you out there trying to do this be careful of the third party manufacturers that don't have as much vested into our state and region or the connection like we got through Jay Cotty because they're not necessarily all in the same boat. And that's where we actually ran into all of our problems is when we got outside of the state. So maybe we'll fix some of these things and bring it back in here soon. So with that, thank you very much for your time.